Welcome to part two of It Seems So Innocent in 1975. We pick up the action where we left off last week. CompuServe was one of the biggest. They were like AOL. Before AOL, there was CompuServe. Oh, I see. They okay. were gigantic. And okay. the thing with them is you'd get an email address, but it wasn't your name. It was just a series of numbers. And so Good for I, anonymity, I guess. I guess it was maybe your account number. Do you remember the early days of the internet? I mean, there was no search engines. You would go to something like Alta Vista. I'm teaching graphic design at one point, so this is like uh, late night. Just, just as, as Google is coming out. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big Alta Vista fan. There was there was bunches so, of so them. So was I. There was no... Ask Jeeves. There was a whole bunch yes, of, Ask of Jeeves, these things. Yeah. Mama, but I, remember Mama? I don't remember Mama. Okay. And Mama. there was some that were specific to Canada or Quebec. I think you had like Red Canoe, I think was one of them. Maybe. Don't remember that. And there was one that was uh, specific to Quebec. I can't remember the name. So I, I'm teaching class and these, kids, these guys are talking in class. And the guy's talking about Google. And he mentions Google as a search engine. Google, I never heard of this thing. I said, everybody uses Alta Vista, baby. What are you talking about? Yeah. Google, what is, within a year, Alta Vista was gone. Google yeah. had taken over like instantly. Well, there was Netscape Navigator. I used yeah. that because it was installed Mosaic. in Avon. Mosaic. Would have Mosaic. Been, was because I remember somewhere in there, I recall learning on my own that I could install things on a computer. <laughs> and you could download something that, like you could download Alta Vista. Yeah. Like this was a huge revelation. I was like, oh, I can just get stuff. For free, which I loved about the early internet. It's still to some yeah. extent the case now. But we, it was exciting, right? Some, exciting. some guy would decide, oh, I, I'm making a new browser. You'd have this constant switching. It's like, oh, Netscape version whatever is out. So you'd install it. And then Microsoft came out with Internet Explorer. That's right. And then, oh, Internet Explorer 1.5 is out. And you test it out and you go, wow, it renders faster than yeah. Netscape. So you'd uninstall Netscape. And then you'd be running... Uh, Internet Explorer for six months and Netscape version four would come out and you go, oh, let me try. Oh my God, it's faster. And you kept piggybacking as they kept improving. Today, they're pretty much all the yeah. same. But back then it was the Wild West. It was exciting. And same thing with email. You mentioned Lotus Notes. We had Lotus Notes at the toy company. And that's the place where I probably used the email the most. My first real exposure. There is when I f we first started using a lot of email and, you know, learning about attachments. You know, Lotus Notes, we ended up using at the hospital for years until eventually they moved us all to Outlook, which was in some ways was good, in some ways was bad. Lotus was an ugly pig of a program and still looked like it had yeah. been made in the early 2000s, if even then. And Outlook had a more modern interface, but the search in Lotus Notes was much more powerful. And in Lotus, you could open emails in tabs. So for me, if someone yeah, sent me an that. email that I needed to follow up on, I would just double click and it would open as a tab. And so I'd have my things to follow up as tabs. For life of me, I could not figure out how to do this in Outlook. And Outlook, I had to either flag it or give it a, a, some sort of status. And I'm like, no, I just want it as a tab. Yeah. What can I do a tab? Yeah. This tab is open. It tells me, idiot, you need to do this, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was another revelation. Eh? Like the computer telling you what you hadn't done. <laughs> oh, by the way, you haven't done the following 19 things. <laughs> Don't shut me down for the yeah. night. And it was the same way with email. Eudora would come out and then you, oh, yeah. Eudora sounds good. And then Claris made their own email program. So you played with that and you would bounce around with email entering all your pop stuff. Remember? Oh, yes. So yeah, my, pop, my yeah. ingoing server, outgoing server. Pop server, yeah, am right. I, am I using this or that and entering all this info into there? SMTP, small mail transfer protocol, all that yeah, business, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All that stuff. Now you don't even think about it. Everything is IMAPs. You see, I use Firefox as my browser to this day. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure that dates back. 20 years for sure. And I remember discovering Firefox. I don't know how. And it was like my personal twist. Yeah, I used Firefox. Like it was, yeah, it was cool. Eh? Like I'd mention it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Eh? Like in <laughs> restaurants, eh? Yeah, yeah. I used With Firefox. your beret and your and cigarette. My t-shirt, yes. I'm a Firefox man Firefox. or whatever. Firefox. I would never give it up because it's got a bunch of extensions on it that yeah. I like and I, it's yeah, fine, you, whatever. You're used to it now. Used to yeah. it now. Yeah, yeah, that was a whole thing. That whole era. Remember you did suddenly download. I remember downloading a program called Crescendo that allowed you to listen to music on the PC. Because I was on a PC, right, at mm -hmm. home. You're always downloading stuff. This and that, the other thing. And you're bumping right into Napster bumping it, You're bumping into Napster. And there's one story I should tell here, and it's the first website I remember that left an impact on me. Howard Stern is broadcasting on Shome for a period of time. Yeah. You remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. So Howard one morning, and I've got the radio on in my office. Howard is talking about a website called Real Doll. <laughs> <laughs> this came up in one of our early yeah. dystopian, where they're making high quality, realistic love dolls for men who want that kind of companionship. And Howard's all over this and you can customize them, different builds, different complexions, the whole thing. So we're like, hold on, we've got the internet. So a bunch of guys are in my office, close the door, and we're on the real doll site. We can't believe what we're seeing. It's basically a menu, like on blonde hair, blue eyes, measurements, boom, this, this, and that, the whole thing. 
and your real doll is shipped to you in like a giant unlabeled box makes you wonder what people would think was being delivered to your house in the giant unlabeled box like something shows up like it looks the size of a coffin but there's no markings on it what would they think anyways how so was it Dave? you'd have to talk to my colleagues <laughs> somewhere in there i think somebody figured out you could save an image off oh, the website yes, yes we were sold on the internet so thank you howard Thank you, Real Doll, who were somebody else. Now, that was the internet. I remember we would receive, before memes that you would see everywhere, yeah. like on TikTok or Instagram or whatever now. Little baby with the fist bump, that stuff, yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I remember the first one I saw was, and it would have been sent around by email. And it was the little video of the monkey who scratches his butt, smells it, and falls out of the oh, tree. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a classic. That's the first anything really, meme eh? like if you want to call it whatever that I remember receiving on the internet and it came via email it's a classic yeah I wonder yeah. if I have that yeah I should look for it's that it's available yeah. I've seen it recently yeah. and I went oh my god it's still there it's yeah. still there and it was a tiny little video like and the yeah. fact that video actually played was amazing oh that was a big deal you were yeah. right yeah I remember it freezing a lot just wouldn't play yeah all that yeah, stuff yeah and the wars between QuickTime which was on the Mac and eventually came out for Windows and then you had real player for for uh, oh my god real player yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. i have completely forgot yeah, real player and there was another one i can't remember now windows media players yeah the, the, the windows, windows media, media player was yeah, the other right. one yeah and you remember winamp dave winamp the no. first big no. mp3 player for windows i didn't know what it was but yeah. i can recall seeing the name i remember discovering mp3s at one point and i'm i'm at the toy company here and i can still picture myself exactly which office i'm in i read somewhere about the mp3 format and that this can take music and you can download music. And this is just just as, as Napster and LimeWire sure. and everything yeah. was about to explode. And discovering all the programs that you could install on your computer to listen to MP3s. And the advent of taking a CD, putting it in your computer and ripping it to MP3s, right? I did that. And yeah. I remember there was a program for the Mac called SoundJam that was made by, I can't remember the name of the company, that Apple bought the software off them and it became iTunes. It was like magic being able to put a CD in your computer yeah. and then er, 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 out came MP3s and then you listen to it through your little program and then you didn't need the CD with you anymore. So you could have like files on your computer and listen to music. I don't know, it seems insane today, but back then it was such a revelation. I remember calling people into my office going, music is playing here on my computer through this thing called MP3. Like, what does it stand for? Like, I don't know. And Winamp uh, was everywhere. There was skins for Winamp. Eventually, Winamp came to the Mac Windows amplifier, I guess. And people would have different skins and different looks. And it kind of looked a little bit like a car stereo. Because the height of audio right. things in those days, remember right. the, the guys with their car stereos, with the, the colors and the stuff, and you'd spend like two grand, and they'd have this thing installed in their car. Thinking about the digital overhaul, I want to work in another little section here about games. We were both fans of pinball and early electronic gaming, and I'm going to date this to probably 1992, 1993. So around the same time as I'm learning Quark Express, we were at an off-site meeting, Avon again, because I was there through all those years, and our president, a very distinguished woman that we all looked up to, was talking about playing Zelda on her Super Nintendo. And I was like, why is our president talking about playing video games? To me, I'd grown past video games. And I listened and listened and listened. Out I went to Toys R Us the next day and picked up a, a Super Nintendo system and Zelda, A Link to the Past. Brought it home and thus began the second phase of my gaming life, which continues to this day. It's gone through the Super Nintendo, got a Game Boy, all the games back in the day. Then I got into PC gaming a little bit later, culminating in really complex flight sims where I had the proper controls for the aircraft. I mean, the virtual aircraft, pedals on the floor, a thing called a HOTUS, a hands-on throttle and stick. And my crowning glory was a little gizmo, the name of which escapes me, that you would put on the top of your computer. It was like a little camera, so it looked like a webcam. They would give you a little supply of these reflective stickers that you would put on the brim of a baseball cap. How nerdy is this? And the camera would read your head position in the cockpit. So as you're flying your Spitfire or your Zero or your Messerschmitt, as you turn your head slightly, you were turning, which relieved you of controlling your view with the stick the hat switch suddenly you were free to fight i love that so you turned your head and on screen the image would, would uh, correct turn with it took you maybe an hour to get used yeah. to it and you could calibrate it and then it was magic 
Because yeah. you could use the stick for all the fighting controls. And I was always mad yeah, and if you wanted to look left, you could look, look left. left. Look right, just yeah. like that. And off you went. I love that. That cost me a lot of money in terms of upgrading my PC. This is where any experience I have, adding sound cards, graphics cards, adding mm-hmm. RAM. At one point, I put a fan on the computer. I remember telling you that because my graphics card had locked up because the flight sim was too intense. It's overheating. Uh, oh, I was looking for frames. I love that. This is after having played a number of games on the like Ghost Recon on the PC, oh, yeah. Tomb Raider and all these things things and that continues to this day with a ps4 that i have and i bought a nintendo switch a couple years ago typically in the winter not in the summer i love a good video game love it so dave are the yoke and the pedals and all that is it down in the bunker you know what it was until last year i did a major clean out oh. and i gave it all to one of the local charity. historical societies uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah one of the local nerd colleges <laughs> I was not a huge gamer. On the PC, I had a couple of games. I mentioned Stealth Fighter. There was also a submarine one, which I loved. I can't remember the name of it. I'd love to find that again. You were in a submarine. Yeah. You could pop up and look through the periscope. But most of the time, you had to learn to read the sonar, and you would just... I would love a good submarine game, because yeah. I like the whole yeah. idea of a submarine. It was a great game. I love that. Those are the two I remember. But I also had, and this pains me to admit, Leisure Suit Larry. Leisure now- <laughs> <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry. Leisure Suit Larry. Was Should I leave the room at this point? <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry would have ordered a real doll. <laughs> oh, I see. He sounds like that kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Think of The Sims way before The Sims was even a thing. It was like a series of games that you would buy. I bought this at Crazy Irving. You remember Crazy, Crazy Irving downtown? Irving? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, Larry is a sleazy guy and you have like a mission. He's got to try to find love. The graphics are kind of crude by today's standard. He comes across someone and there's a series of things you can ask. You might have three different choices. You say, uh, you know, hit on them, ask them where the nearest bathroom is, tell them they're pretty, whatever. I'm making things up. And I got stuck at one point. I'm so embarrassed that I never finished the game because <laughs> I got stuck, which kind of reflected my life anyways. Like 20 but, years ago? <laughs> you mean it's still waiting for you to continue? To- so, somewhere on whoever Out whoever there. owns the PC. There's probably remnants of Larry. I just picture him trying to get out of the hard drive somewhere. Wow. The big revolution for me back then, I think, was playing Quake. Not so much because playing Quake was the revolution, but in the midst of that, I discovered accidentally sideways multiplayer gaming. I didn't know what multiplayer meant. I think what I probably thought it had to do was with LAN parties, which I'd heard of, but didn't know anybody, whatever, I was not going to have a LAN party. Maybe I was reading on the internet. I downloaded this little program called GameSpy. And GameSpy was locating servers for different games for you. From within GameSpy, I'd open Quake, list of servers, low pings, all that, all new world. And I realized rather quickly, I'm in a game with other humans. They're just somewhere else. And I almost shit myself with excitement. It was like this, (laughs) wow. Because instead of the AI, you know, you figure out the routines... These like real guys running around, getting pissed off if you kind of hide somewhere on, in a high level and just shoot people. And I remember talking to these guys. Guys said, yeah, I'm, I'm at the University of North Carolina, yeah, yeah. whatever. I was amazing. Then this carried on when I flew the flight sim. That was very multiplayer. I'd log on with all kinds of guys. I used to play with a guy, some guys in a, in a Finnish Finland server a lot because they were gentlemanly players. What you get sometimes, you get you log on to these servers, you warm up your Spitfire, take off, and as soon as you were airborne, some idiot would shoot you down. I was like, come on. Are we trying to have fun here or are you just trying to rack up kills? So never go there again. The Finnish guys were very gentlemanly. We'd yeah. all get together and we'd fly together in formation. We could talk to each other. This sounds hyper nerdy. I know. I don't care. I loved it. I miss it. You should have flown with the Swiss. They'd never attack you. <laughs> <You're right>. They're neutral. <laughs> yeah. On the Mac, I remember one of the first games I remember seeing on the Mac, my brother had this, was a game called Dark Castle, okay. which was this, would it be called, I guess, a side scroller today? Yeah, side scroller, And uh, sure. I don't know if you you remember that. No, but it looks like yeah. a lot of side scrollers I've seen. Yeah, it was kind of cool. There was little spiders that would come down and stuff. Yeah. And it was so cool to play this on the little nine inch Mac. Most of the games I've played for whatever bizarre reason turns out to be golf. Nothing wrong okay. with that. On the Mac, I had gotten and received in the mail a promotion from Buick. It came in the mail. So this is the point Buick where... Buick car, the car people, You Buick. remember people, people would send out CDs. Remember a famous AOL or would, would yeah. send out this, you know, yeah. get connected with AOL. Yeah, yeah. Well, Buick send out a CD. And on the CD, 
sorry, I'm lying. I don't even think it was a CD because this would have been the old Mac. There was no CD player. So it would have been a floppy. And on there was a promotion for their cars. So you could look on your Mac, a little oh, cars. Right. And complimentary right, to that right. was a golf game. And it was the, like, oh, they bundled like, the golf game yes, on there. Yes, they bundled oh, a golf game yeah. for the Mac. Man, we had so much fun. It was multiplayer. Well, multiplayer in that you could play, you could set up multiple players and yeah. you could play and then you'd move over and your friend would take over the keyboard. He'd play his player right. and then you could play. We had a blast playing that thing. And I remember I even bought like a real golf game later on. And I'm like, you know, it's not as much fun as the Buick version. And I remember getting the Tiger Woods golf later on and whatever. And it, yeah. I never captured the magic I had of playing golf on this tiny little you get screen. That sometimes. Yeah. They were a yeah. certain game just works for you. And I think it's the fact that it wasn't trying to be realistic. And it's not that it yeah. was cartoonish because, you know, yeah. like uh, you have a lot of games now that are super cartoony. It wasn't that. I think there was a certain innocence to us at the time. And it was the fact that you could actually, you know, move your, you have to hold your mouse down and then the little meter would go across and you let go at certain point to get the power meter. Oh, yeah, and the then you could, meter. you could hook or slice or whatever. Wow. This kind of stuff. And you have to, I think you had to pull back on this one. You'd pull, you'd click the mouse and you'd pull straight back and then you'd let go of the mouse and, and it would go and if you move the mouse left or right it would hook or slice something like that two Christmases ago on the same note I bought a um, Super Nintendo Classic yes all the games are pretty low all the ones I was paying 95 bucks a piece for at Toys R Us are on it they're all there like Castlevania Zelda's there and Mario and Donkey Kong all the rest I plugged it in here and was ready for I was like you know what? I'll play Zelda again I'll take myself back to 1993 and all will be right in the world not so just not it's not there. That which absorbed me completely at the time, I find a bit silly now. Not that I wouldn't try it again, but I was kind of like, oh no. I wanted it to be the same. There's also the fact that we were playing on CRTs then. And yeah. there's, there's a certain distortion, a certain look to the game that I think helps add to the nostalgia. Probably. So now when you play them on our LCD monitors or whatever, it doesn't quite look the same. It doesn't quite look the same. And I know they've had to tweak some of the games for them to look right here. And if you're a real nerd, I, I remember doing a little dive on this. If you're a real nerd, you will hunt up an, an old CRT and you will right. hook up like the Raspberry Pi has a lot of emu emulators for this kind of thing. And you can hook this up through analog connectors yeah. back into your TV to get that retro feel right. and to get the syncing right also. Well, they do give you some options, some graphics options on this little Nintendo thing. Yeah. I forget what they are, but it's kind of like pixel rendering options. And yeah. I think it's trying to emulate an older look or something. Because yeah, I think you could... pixels or, or rectangular pixels. Because TVs had the rectangular... Did they? I think so. Oh, that's it. Then. Is that what it was? Know. Yeah. So depending if you hook it up to a uh, a flat screen or a CRT, you may okay. want to change the settings or whatever. I know I'm kind of backtracking a bit on our on the episode here, but man, did I have fun with that Super Nintendo. So much fun. Well, I had a friend who had one of those. This would have been just before, uh, this would be early 90s. I'm not sure which Nintendo version. Apart from the Pong, we had the house. We never had a, We never had a, any kind of console. But he had this thing and I would sit there at his, at his place and watch for hours as he tried to do Super Mario. Should right. get to the end. I had as much fun watching as I did playing. And who knew that... <laughs> <laughs> 20 years, 30 years later, this would be a thing. Like you have Twitch and YouTube now where you can watch someone play a game. And who would have thought that this would be a form of entertainment? Not playing the game, <laughs> yeah, right. but watching someone yeah. play the and, game. And I've done that, honestly. Yeah, I've watched. I, yeah. I still do it to this day. Uh, there's a couple of guys there. I, I've watched the yeah. whole thing. My kids used to love watching me play, especially Quake, because I would get killed a lot. I called <laughs> myself Fragenstein, like fragging. Like yeah, fragging. Yeah, yeah. And I was good at taking down yeah. enemies. But if you looked at my ratio of kills to be, I, I was just, I was, I was just, uh, every, I was everybody's bitch. And they could kill me, and I always enjoyed, <laughs> enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Kids would would enjoy that. Oh yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I'm thinking, Richard, that we need to transition to maybe the final phase of this saga, which is the impact of digital technology on our other great hobby, photography. So for us, there's always been photography around the house. My godfather was an amateur photographer. He always had a camera with him, always took pictures. And he was a Yashica guy. So he had like a Yashica Electro 35, and yeah, GS Electro right. 35, which I liked so much, I ended up buying one later on. The first camera I remember, apart from my mom's green brownie, we were given at some point a 110 camera. 
You remember one ten film? The yeah. long thin ones. Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. Like a, and, yeah. And for some reason, I'm thinking Hanimax as a yeah, okay, brand. Hanimax, yeah. I okay. think it might have been a Hanimax, and you yeah. would have had the flip flash. We yeah. had eight shots. Like imagine a long chocolate bar yeah. with two connectors, one at each end. Right. You pop your four. You'd pull it out, turn it down, plug it in the other way. Yeah. And you'd have your other four shots, and it might have been shared between me and my younger brother. We might have gotten one each. I don't really remember. From there, I remember at one point getting an Olympus Trip Thirty Five. I know the camera you mean. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful camera. It's, Classic. It's, yeah. 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 It's got that great sharp lens on it. That's the camera I remember being my first camera. My brother argues that the first camera we got was some sort of folding camera and that I broke it trying to close it. And I don't know which model that was. Well, and I believe it because my wife has her grandmother's old Kodak Retina 1 from the early on. 30s. Really? It still works. And it has a lens that pops out like a little door. Sure. And when to close it, you have to make sure that the lens is not at infinity, but at it's close focusing point okay and then you got to hit a switch and then you can close it or otherwise you could damage the lens yes which apparently is what i did i remember that being my uh my first film camera and then from there no camera for a long time and i guess we hit the digital world which for me would have been my first digital camera would have been the olympus e20 now the e20 is what i guess they call a bridge camera which is it's a digital camera with a built-in lens not okay. like a point I and understand. shoot with a little, I yeah. but this was like the size of a but 30. But no interchangeable lenses no. there. Okay. And it had a 35, 140 or something, something like that on it, like a decent lens fast enough. Yeah. And it was a big, heavy camera. And it was like a four megapixel camera, maybe. I'm thinking 2002. I think I found this on a photography forum. It might've been photo.net, which was big back then. My brother had the E10 and this guy was selling the E20 with a whole bunch of accessories, a grip, all sorts of stuff for $1,000. And is that a good price? <laughs> That's a lot of money. I wasn't working. Oh, okay. So, yeah, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, sweetie. That was to my wife. And so I called the guy up and I talk about it, uh, whatever. I'm like, okay, man, I'm sending you the money. And I remember at the time going, this is $1,000. I'm sending to some guy. I don't know. I have no guarantee. This is not eBay. This is not Kijiji. There's no trace. We've communicated, I guess, by email. But I looked at my email. I could not find anything. And so I sent it to them. And like a week or so later, the box arrived and everything's in there. And it was a great camera. I used that for, for a few years until I moved to, um, might have been the Canon Rebel. Canon decided to make... Well, I had a Canon a Rebel at one point. A yeah. Canon Rebel Digital, That's which right. I hated. It was a terrible camera. The yeah. pictures were always soft on one side. Could never figure out if... I think it, I bought it because I could afford... Like, yes, I, it was very affordable. I, I knew I needed a digital camera, quote unquote, and I'll get to that afterwards, yeah. but I said, okay, I'll buy that. And then from that, I wanted a Leica. So I bought the Leica Digilux 2, which was their second version of a digital camera. It's a great camera, insanely sharp lens. It was a fixed lens. Well, fixed lens. It was a, a little zoom on it, but it wasn't interchangeable. Six megapixel, I think it was. Fantastic. Till the sensor failed and I had to send it back to Germany. It took six months for Leica oh, to repair it. you told me that once, yeah. yeah. And from there, I moved on to Pentax for many years. Uh, and then eventually now I'm a Fuji guy and I got right. my Fuji X100S. Haven't looked back since. Love that camera. I started early as well. I took my first photographs summer 1974 using my dad's Kodak Brownie. Still have it here. They bought me a decent camera for Christmas that year, a Minolta Hymatic 7S. Fast forward, I was an on and off photographer over the years, over the decades. By 2001, I joined the camera club, our local camera club that we talked mm -hmm. about, the Lakeshore Camera Club here in Montreal. I had a film camera at the time. As I got into the club and started to meet people, there was discussion about digital photography. It would come up in the breeze, not seriously. The whole club was conventional, if you will. And I can recall thinking, oh no, it's followed me here too. I consider myself very digital. I've always taken to the technology, love learning software. I just was like, not photography too. Because I loved taking slides. I love mm -hmm. photographing slides. Going to the, in this case, the little processing place down in Point Claire Village. Oh yeah, yeah. Photoco, yeah. getting my slides, holding them up to the light and going, yeah, I nailed it. There was something pure yeah. about that. And I just didn't want to be in front of a computer again. Another reason to stick me in front of a monitor with a keyboard and a mouse in my hand, I was like, oh, fuck. It didn't happen for years. The club was a bit slow to accept the transition to digital, but it did. And when it happened, it was like an avalanche. So by the summer of 2007, I was president at that point. We had become digital. The last holdouts had given up and we were a digital club. No more slides in the projector. And uh, I finally broke down somewhere in there and got that Canon Rebel. Didn't use it much, but just felt good that I had a digital camera. Yay. 
when I really got into it was the summer of 2010. I got a little, um, uh, I know these camera names are not interesting to people who aren't photographers, but it was a little Lumix yeah. that I still have. And I could post-process on the iPad because I didn't want to learn Photoshop. I didn't want to sit in front of my computer processing images. I didn't want to be there. I wanted this to be something else. So I liked the fact that I could sit on my couch and post-process my photos in the iPad. That gave me permission to get into digital photography. I started to post pictures to Flickr, you know, so all that stuff came into play. Yeah. I love digital photography now. I have my own uh, website, one of these where you pay a certain monthly fee. I enjoy post-processing. I still do it more for my photographs on the iPad than not. I haven't photographed much in the last couple of years. Got myself a whole bunch of great digital gear that'll last me for the rest of my life. So I guess at the end of the day, digital overtook that as well. So work, gaming, photography, general communication. I mean, here, here we are. Everything uh, went digital, eh? Except eating. I don't eat digitally yet. Well, you do order digitally. I, I order, yeah, order oh. digitally. Yeah, you can order through your phone. <laughs> yeah. The thing about it in the old days, yeah. oh, pull out the menu and order from the from, yes. the, from the menu on a, on your analog phone. What's interesting is today, even with digital, we're seeing a sort of resurgence to the analog ways. We're, we're you know the resurgence of LPs, vinyl. Cat herself, our guest last week, likes vinyl. And has a turntable. You were seeing a lot of that, people rediscovering. And I think a lot of it is a generation that had no exposure to it. And so yeah. for them, it's new. So for them, they don't know the opposite to joy of sitting on the uh, on the couch and having to flip the goddamn record. So yeah. the, they will and, eventually... And film, film photography, right? Yeah, film photography. There's a certain... I, I mean, look, I've gone out. I've bought film cameras. I've, sure. I may have owned 20 or 30 sure. of them over the years. Sure. I shot my honeymoon on a, on a film camera. I took a Yashica Mat 124 G to my honeymoon in Tahiti and shot fully uh, film. It was a beautiful shots. They're still in nostalgia. I still own three or four film cameras now. I own one. I think I will. You I still I, have your Hymatic, right? I have the Hymatic. That's yeah. right. I don't think I'll ever shoot film again for the rest mm. of my life. I don't, I don't miss it that much. Mm -hmm. What I've always loved about digital photography is chimping. What we call chimping. Take the photograph, have a look on the viewfinder. You get that instant confirmation. I seem to have got it, right? And it looks like a little slide. I nailed, I nailed it looks like a little slide. Exactly. I nailed the exposure. I move on. So it's really good from that perspective. You know, I'm surprised that they haven't, nobody came out with the cheesy effect of having, when you look on the back, a little slide frame that would appear there, um, right? I so, bet they're out there somewhere. You have to feel. <laughs> I'm surprised like, uh, you know, an early Kodak digital camera didn't have this on there. You Maybe know? that's an idea. At the toy company, I remember when, when this stuff started coming out, we bought a Sony Mavica. It was like a 1.2 megapixel digital camera I've heard of it? Yeah. that stored its uh, shots on a floppy disk. I still have some of my earliest digital photos are from there. So you would take a picture, the shutter would go, and then you'd hear <laughs> as it wrote the file oh, to God. the floppy drive, and you could feel it shaking as it wrote the file and you could hear the floppy drive being written well that to. noise you just made is really it i know that noise i think you get 10 shots on a floppy drive i say floppy but it was a it was a yeah. three, a three yeah. and a half i remember we had an artist who would produce stuff in clay and it would produce it. and we take the little 1.2 megapixel camera and i had this tiny studio in my mouth and we'd shoot it and then close cut that and drop it into our lap i mean it was terrible you couldn't do anything past its actual size you couldn't blow it up it was just terrible but it gave us that immediacy that we could do quick layouts there was a time there around the same time i bought my first digital camera that where i photographed with my ipad for a year I walk around, hold the iPad yep. up, take photographs, post process. Instagram. Instagram. When we discovered Instagram. Yeah, because you introduced a number of us to Instagram, summer of 2010. No concept then of what sharing meant in that context. And suddenly there we were taking pictures, posting them, all commenting. It was like a blast. Oh, and then yeah. I got into iPhoneography. I loved iPhoneography. I used to, remember I did that presentation? Yeah, we, I, I, exactly. I bought all the apps, tried all the apps, loved it, loved it. Loved the fact that I could do it all in the phone. Take the picture, post-process, stick it on Instagram. I loved it. I bought little lenses for it, the little holo clip lens. Yep. I got kind of a, a wide angle effect and a telephoto effect. Loved it to death. I still have my moment lenses and my and my current oh, phone moments? still oh, yeah. has the, the bayonet mount for the moment lenses, oh, yeah. which I pull out every so often. Yeah, I've got the bayonet mount too, but I have no lenses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I loved iPhoneography. I just had so much fun with that. When I left work in November of 2011, I decided I needed a, a new uh, a new project and I went out and I picked up a couple of film cameras, some old Olympus Pen half-frame cameras to work on a project. I didn't want to just 
take my phone or my existing Fuji. I just wanted something that would push me to do something I hadn't done in a long time was to shoot film. Sure. Just for the novelty of it. And I don't want to say novelty as if I've never done it, but it's a sort of revisiting the novelty of yeah. it. But also to shoot half frame, right? Which is a 35 millimeter, but vertical. So what that means, folks, on photographers is on a roll of film where you might get 24 exposures, the half frame camera gives you 48, if you remember film days. Yeah. Uh, so smaller negative, but cheaper on the film. <laughs> it was. Well, that's the thing. It, yeah. it, it was produced in Japan in the, in the 60s when the price of film was very expensive in Japan and Olympus decided to come out with these half frame cameras. Is that why they did it? Yes. Oh, yes so it was did. an economic yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, thing. Yeah, oh, yeah. I had no idea. And you know, it's kind of made a resurgence because there's a camera called the Ektar 35 that was just released. It's like a I don't know, $100 camera maybe. And yeah. it's half frame. It's a film camera. Someone released Interesting. today a half frame yeah. film camera. So listen, I've shot a few rolls. I have had nothing developed. Is it crap? It might be. But you know what? I had fun shooting. And because it's half frame, it's not horizontal. It's vertical. And I like vertical shots because we tend to shoot, well, with the phones, we tend to shoot everything vertical. But usually with a camera, you, you tend to shoot horizontal because that's that's the point of view. That's how view. you see the world, right? Yeah. We sort of see the world horizontally. Yeah. I always have to remind myself to go vertical. So this forces you to shoot vertical and forces you in a way to think outside you know i don't want to say outside the box but think outside the frame ha ha uh. Uh, see what i did there <laughs> we'll see what comes of it like everything uh photography has evolved movie making has evolved everything has evolved to the digital world and i guess at some point reality will involve evolve into the metaverse perhaps we'll have to talk about that <laughs> but as a final thought because i think we're getting close yep. to conclusion Let's talk about what we're doing right now, the podcasting. It's completely digital. We're recording onto, onto a little recording device. It'll come out of that device on a little SD card like you get in your camera, same card. It'll be stuck in a computer, edited digitally on some free software, open yeah. source software called Audacity in this yeah, case, yeah, yeah. and uploaded to uh, various websites and social media sites and you know YouTube and all the rest of it. It would be the modern day equivalent of ham radio, I guess, or pirate radio in yeah, a sense back yeah, then. Fair where, enough, yeah. You know, you could not be uh, your own radio station, right? I mean, this was frowned upon by the FCC and, yes. and whatever because they want to control the airwaves. I don't know yeah. why. Otherwise, I guess we'd get noise everywhere. So today we have the modern equivalent. I think we're having fun. Uh, yeah. It's pretty easy to get into. You can do it with an iPhone by yourself if you wanted to. I think, again, was something else that we can't say we did in the past because we didn't really. Although, <laughs> I remember me and my younger brother uh, using a tape recorder to uh, create plays. We would write scripts and we would create plays oh, and really? record them onto the tape as if we were producing our own show. So, you know what? I'll take it as that has now okay. evolved into this. So now I'll unearth this one. In the mid-70s, a couple of my buddies would come to my house. We had a little tape recorder like everybody had. Yeah. Bought this little device with a suction cup that you could stick on the phone so you could hear a phone conversation. Yeah, and yeah. we would make prank phone calls <laughs> to, and record the prank phone calls. My friend Wes was particularly good at stringing people along, <laughs> calling from CJD, this is whatever. Yeah. You got a chance to win whatever. There was no winning, no nothing. And then he finally said, you've won a, a garbage bag full of doo-doo or something, right? And you get yeah. this <laughs> silence, right? You know, they've been having, you know, that's not very funny. I felt badly for these people, but he was good at it. Are those tapes in the bunker? You know what? I think so. Oh, that would be fun. I think so, yeah. I, I think so. I wonder if there's any uh, statute of limitations or something. Can yeah, I don't know. Can, no, we, can we like <laughs> encode those and maybe pop one into an episode? Yeah, because we're talking 1974. Right? Yeah. There's actually a tape down there of me as an 11 year old being interviewed on my attitude about drugs in high school. <laughs> I don't know why. And this little squeaky, squeaky voice, unlike my <clears throat> somewhat cold, inflected voice today, is saying, Well, I don't think I'll ever do drugs. <laughs> and if somebody offers me drugs, I'll certainly say no or something, something like this. <laughs> wow. Okay, we got to find those. Yeah, so ma find maybe those, we'll yeah. do an episode. Episode is is uh, splunking through uh, Dave's cave. Splunking, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> splunking at I, Dave's place. I have some ropes at home, and that? I can get the spiked shoes. Okay, and we can go down into the bunker. It'll be an audio experience for the guests. Yeah, we'll bring the whole thing, the camera down there, the whole thing. Eh? Oh yeah, yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> I think that's a wrap. Yep, I think it is. That's going to be one heck of an episode, Richard. Yeah. I hope a, so. That's a megasode. <laughs> <laughs> have a great week. Bye. Bye. Bye.